Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, how can we create equality of opportunity for every student? And I'm in conversation with Haroon Bashir, the Equality Manager and Deputy Designated Safeguarding Lead at Hales Owen College. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Harun Bachia. Um, I work at Hales Owen College and my role is Equality Manager and Deputy ESL. So some of my role involves dealing with um, the equality aspect and making sure that students feel that they're well respected in the Owen College and also that they're treated safely and my specialism within the safeguarding I suppose is online safety and also dealing with prevention. That's quite a lot of hats you're wearing there, actually, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. I do a little bit of teaching as well, just to um, keep myself sort of um, engaged in that. Just, just to make sure that that 25th hour in the day is, is fully utilised. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, how long have you done the um, this, this role? Uh, the safeguarding role, um, this is my fourth year now. Mm-hmm. So my background is that I, was t- um, I still teach accounts. So accounting sort of the, the subject that I teach and... It doesn't work, but it does. And then I've sort of had a really keen interest in the pastoral side of things, where um, I like working with students. I think they're really interesting. Go, then that, that, they're at that sort of crossroads in their life where they're not sure what they want to do, and it's just really helping and supporting them, and you can make a really big difference in their life. So I've then sort of worked more in pastoral, and then I worked with some curriculum, and then I've gone back to pastoral. And then I've realised that I actually do like working with students and making that difference. And the safeguarding role makes me, allows me to give the opportunity to make that difference at a higher level. And what does that, when you say making a difference, I mean, what, what does that kind of, what does that mean? What does success look like for you there? I suppose it's, um, it's all those things that I took for granted growing up, I suppose, um, aren't things which are the norm with, with some other students. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, I think that, um, you know, even just having a house to go back to and uh, having family around me, I don't, I think there are some students who unfortunately don't have that and it's giving them that, um, rate, help, helping them to believe in themselves and raise their aspirations and, you know, make an impact in life and, you know, they can do it if they really, really try and there's nothing that's stopping them. And I suppose I'm there as a part of the role model because, you know, I'm, you know, I've worked hard for what, where I am. Um, I do find it hard sometimes, you know, I'm not going to be a you know, great student, but I will work hard and I use that because I sometimes find it hard to understand um, difficult concepts or, you know, I'll work and work and work at it and that resilience and that, um, that determination really makes it easy, makes me sympathise and empathise with students and say, look, it can be done. So, um yeah, so it's uh, for me it's a success story so we're coming to the end of the year and I made a few phone calls last Friday where I spoke to some students and um, they they joined us about two years ago and they were in a really difficult situation in their life um, they they were um, in a hospital and they weren't very well and um, we supported those students when they came to the college we made sure that they were um, they had regular meetings and they had a safe place where they could go. And at the end of the year, there are people who are now going to university. Wow. And, um, you know, and it's just seen that difference. And just some saying thank you and seeing that change along that journey as well. So where in the past they might have self-harmed or done something really serious, they've actually, um, they've actually overcome that through a lot of people working together. So college, parents, external services working together and making that difference. Um, it's that must I think, be really rewarding really rewarding oh, definitely um and i think today it's a shame for ch- children because well, for young people because they grow up in such a fear-driven environment if you read the news it's about well you know, the whole country's in debt and they've got to pay that back in the future there's not going to be any jobs and and it's it's a shame really because they naturally you know i i don't remember having that when i was growing up and I just remember you can do what you want and you can really um, aspire to be what you, you, you want to be. Um, but there, but we, bit, we had a bit more resilience and we, we just got on with it. And that was the way things were. But I think, unfortunately, 
kids aren't taught, the young people aren't taught to be resilient as much and it's about just giving them that confidence. It's okay to make mistakes and that bounce ability and if they do make mistakes they can come back and, and as long as they learn from it. And again it's coming back to that safe space where they're not going to be judged or feel threatened. And why do you think that that's sort of changed so much that you know you feel that the kids are less resilient now? I think um, technology plays a big part. Um, so when when I was growing up, if there was a bully at school, or if there was a, if I had a really bad day with people, or um, I'd go home and that was my safe space, and I wouldn't see those people until sort of you know the next morning. Yeah. But now that you've got social media and you've got mobile phones, it's really hard to switch off because they can't. It, it carries on. Yeah. And if and that could go on, you know, late at night, and then it's a bit they sleep, and then they're going to school the next day and they're carrying that with them all the time so having that break and in well when I was growing up in my daily life was a lot easier I think just to put myself into recharge and to rethink and to realign so it's very it's a very much a different climate I think we need to try and understand that when working with young people yeah so it's maybe from what you said not necessarily that they're less resilient but actually just that they've got more to deal with yeah, definitely. I think yeah, you're probably right. I think resilience is probably the wrong word because, um, yeah, I think they're, they're absorbing a lot on their shoulders and I think they just need to focus on what, uh, what how, they can change. How are your students reacting to the kind of the, the current situation? So we're, you know, we're recording this in the middle of um, COVID um, and in the context of the whole kind of Black Lives Matter movement. I think they want to be listened to. I think it's talking to them. I think communication is a key to a lot of this, really. Um, so what we've done at the college is we have a certain number of students that we look after in Safeguard Enrol. And during the whole of the past 100 days, we've made regular weekly contact with them and we've sent emails and um, different reminders on different themes just to keep that continuity going and making sure that they're OK. Um, and we've shared, because we're going through that experience ourselves, yeah. you know, we're sharing our experiences with them as well and we're both we feel, well for me anyway i feel that i'm on the same i'm just slightly ahead of them um and um it's about um it's about saying it's okay to not be okay um and we're in it together and giving them that hope and that you know that light at the end of the tunnel um and supporting them really through it um and i think the same with black lives matter i think there's been a lot of press there and it's you know my own um you know there was a time where i was just watching and reading a lot on twitter around it. it was just the same negativity coming through again and again and videos about these videos about that and i had to take a break from it i had to take a step back and think through this isn't good for you because it was bringing me down and i wasn't in a position to be that person who maybe might be able to influence it and make it better so i had to almost look at it from a pair of eyes that's interesting. And what made you feel that you weren't in a position to influence it and make it better when you're the equality manager in your college? Yeah. I mean, I think it felt very emotional. And I was because I kept it. There's a thing on social media, which is called echo chambers, where people are echoing the same views that you've got all the time. And it gets people riled up, whether it's something to do with racism or something to do with extremism or Brexit. And it's about trying to get that balance, because then you start to see that thing that everybody's the same. and it's, it's not like that. There are so many good things going on in life. And I think if you're constantly fed with that, it does make, um, it does bring you down. And it's almost like your emotions fine, but then your brain needs to take over. You need to start thinking about like, we're going to have students who are going to come here in September and August. They're going to experience issues with COVID. They've not been in education for a long time. They've experienced a lot of um, injustice with Black Lives Matter. Um, and how can we make this a better and safer place for them? So it's sort of, I suppose, I don't want to use the word man up, but I think I have to sort of think differently and how you can start leading people through this. But in order to do that, you need to make sure that you're in a good position yourself. So um, I'm very careful now about how many hours or how many minutes I'm sort of looking on social media and because sometimes it's just not helpful. Is that something that you kind of shared with your students in terms of how you've managed that for yourself? Definitely. Yeah. 
and take them to staff as well because I've delivered some training on online safety and I've said that you know it does have an impact and um, it's, it, I suppose it's balance isn't it and making sure that you've got the information and emotions good but not too much of it because then it can be over and overload and when you are in your home all the time and you can't discuss it with you you know it can lead to you making assumptions about what people are like and um, um, and the world is a horrible place so one of the things we tried to do was um, I think it was an organization called switch promotions um, they basically had during the month of June um, it was almost like a, a gratitude day a gratitude month where every day you would do something different and it would be for somebody else and it was there to sort of improve your mental health um, so it was really quite powerful and we said that with the students so it was one of the um, emails that we would send out to them and say, well, have you tried this or have you tried that? And to do something different would help them grow a little bit more. And, you know, there were things that I did which were different. To help them help them grow. What kind of things? Um, it's really sort of um, just going out and doing some gardening and just planting seeds and um, something, you know, I've done the lawn before and I've cut the hedges, but, you mm -hmm. know, doing, doing things up, and, you know, um, you know, where I think, it, you know, it's quite, it's quite nice and it's very tactile when you sort of just put your hands in sort of soil and just yeah. planting seeds and then going back and waiting for them to grow and you know and even reading I'm not a big reader at all I've started to try and read more so um as an entertainment as, as an enjoyment thing and a release so and even doing this well you know, I'm putting myself out of my comfort zone big time by doing this with you so um, <laughs> um so I've learned that I've got to, if I've got to grow and develop and, you know, I've got to lead by example, really. Yeah. So. It, it, it sounds like you think um, quite a lot about how you are a role model, clearly, to the young people that you work with and um, that you position yourself quite carefully in terms of what you're trying to convey through your actions as well as through your words. Is that fair? Definitely, yes. Yeah. Because I think being from an ethnic minority background, I know how difficult it is when I became a manager, there weren't many managers around. And it's about, you know, not um, not limiting yourself and making sure that, you know, what you do, you, you, it's almost like um, you've got to, you've got to see what you want. You've got to be what you want other people to see. Does that make sense? You, you want to see what you want other people to be, I suppose. So you want to, you know, you're in that position and people can see you and think, oh yeah, Haroon can do it. So, and um, I think it's important for people to see you for who you are. So for example, um, my, my faith is that I'm Muslim and I, you know, I need on prevent. And for some people that shouldn't correlate, but I'm there to actually say, these people don't represent my faith. I'm trying to be a positive role model and a salesman, if you like, for my faith, yeah. um, where I'm showing what it's really about. And um, I want people to then go away and think, well, hang on a minute, if this is happening by these people who are saying this, I know Haroon and he's that, what's going on? And it's sort of like almost just going against what the, the narrative is. Did you have sense. to think carefully about taking on that agenda or was that something that you absolutely knew you wanted to be part of? Um, both really. I want to be part of it, but it's about looking at the best way of getting that message across. And I had to do it my way, I suppose, things that I felt comfortable with. And I've just led some sessions on unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And it's took me about six months to get the tone right and to use the right language because the majority of the staff that I've spoken to are white and there are things in there which could be sensitive for them but i don't want to make it just a white issue it's unconscious biases with all of us and tell us what unconscious bias is so it's it's really thinking about the way that you're thinking and while you're making a decision so 95 percent of what we think about is automatic it's programmed mm -hmm. and it and it's a case of well where does that come from and five percent is thinking just slowing down so those that 95 percent will come back from our own personal experiences what we read in the media what we see on tv and it's about stopping and thinking about the other person so and for that to happen we need to sort of slow down and really look at the other person and look at their point of view and how did you find the right tone then 
I think I, um, I used quite a few videos and I made sure that the video, I, I didn't, um, because we've had to do it on sort of remotely, um, I've used quite a few videos which I've asked people to come forward to discuss and I'd like to think that people at the college think that I'm balanced and I'm a good egg and they can come and speak to me, which they do anyway. And it's building on what we do at the college already with inclusion. So I've used the college, I've used um, sort of, I would say generic terms and then sort of delved a bit deeper and then come back out. But the examples I've given aren't just about black and white, it's about male or female, it's about sexuality, um, it's about different religions. So people can relate to different aspects of it. So, um, yeah, so it's very important that I have that interaction. And there has been sessions where um, I've spoken to staff at the end and they say, well, I don't agree with this particular aspect. And we've had a discussion. And, um, and it's educational and I've not been emotional at all about it. And I firstly thank them for you know, voicing their concern and we can have that discussion. Um, and, you know, that conversation for me hasn't finished. It's something that will carry on in the future. Um, and I've mentioned, um, I don't know if you saw the, um, the Channel 4 programme at the school that tried to end racism. I've not seen the programme, but I've, I've read about it. Right. It's really powerful. It's very, very interesting because one of the, they, they question and they discuss um, issues with the Year 7 group from a school in, I think it's in South London, and they split them up. And what well, they're saying, well, if you're splitting them, isn't that causing them? But they're splitting them up so people can feel safe and then they're bringing them back together. So they split them by ethnicity? Or? Ethnicity. Yeah. So you had, uh, you had the white students in one group and then you had the non-white students in the other. And then as the weeks went on, because I think it was a, um, a number of weeks, pro um, mm -hmm. the, the school programme was on for, um, they then split up the non-white group into Asian and then black. Mm -hmm. And even within those groups, there's differences. So um, it's, it was really interesting. And I think one of the questions is that we don't, we're not aware of. Um, I remember going to an, LG, uh, an LGBT talk and there was a question that was posed to the audience. At what age did you realise that you were heterosexual? And I thought that's interesting. Those people who have got an LG, who are from an LGBT background, at a young age or a certain age in their life, they realised that they were different. And I've been, that, that was in my mind and I thought, well, actually, it's exactly the same from being somebody from a different background. Mm -hmm. And when I asked somebody, well, what age did you know that you were white? I go, well, I haven't, I've always been like that. And I go, but for me, when from a young age, from about eight, I realised that I was different and people would, some people would treat me differently. When, when I was at school, I was treated differently to outside school. And it was really interesting because then you're able to actually share your experiences and open the door. But I think people don't, people, I think it's, it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg syndrome. People are too scared to talk about race because they don't want to offend. Yeah. But, or, but you just have to preempt yourself and say, well, look, I don't want to offend, but can I just ask you a question? And I've, it's, you know, I've learned a lot about um, people who have transitioned from uh, female to male over the last sort of four or five years and I've been you know I've, and I've used the same approach I said look, I don't want to offend but can I just ask you a question about this and it's been that open it's been open about how you um well what you're not sure about really and yeah. not do it in, a, in an offensive manner and just ask them nicely and you know I've not had any negative responses back from people when I've asked them. but I am quite inquisitive I do I love cultures different cultures and love backgrounds and um, I find it really fascinating. Do you think that's because, you know, you had that, you said you had that sense from about the age of eight that you, you were, you know, d different than your peers or is it just driven by something deeper? Or? No. I don't know. I just found it interesting. I, I like differences. I think because I'm different, I think I appreciate other differences. And I, I try to look for common commonality between different people as well. So, um, you know, for me, my faith is quite important, and I know for other people, faith is important, whether they're Christian, Muslims, Jews, and Hindu Sikhs. And I try to make that connection with people. So I think for me, it's about making connections and going deeper than yeah. just what's on the outside. And what do you think are the questions that we should be asking? I know when we spoke um, 
a few days ago prior to this then we were having it was really interesting for me hearing a little bit about you know um how you pray and um the kind of the feelings associated with that and you know and, and i found myself thinking i i'm i feel a bit ashamed that i don't know more about this already i've got a lot of muslim friends but i've never thought to ask you know what's it like getting up at three in the morning to pray and i just yeah. what what are the things that you think we should be asking what are the conversations we should be having to have better um, awareness of each other it's a really good question um it's really hard i think um i think conversation just you know, a lot of our lives are very very similar yeah. But there's certain parts where we just dedicate to that act of worship. And I think it goes both ways. I think it's asking people about their faith and also people just being open and asking about yours. And not like, so for example, when it's Ramadan and I'm fasting, yeah. I, I let people know because sometimes my breath might not smell very nice. I might feel a bit tired and I feel a bit weak. Um, and people then ask questions. So I suppose I open the door for that. Yeah. Um, but I think for the, the majority of time where people where people have come to me is when there's been an issue in the workplace, I suppose. And they said, really, can I just ask you, you're Muslim? You know, and that's <laughs> open the discussion. So it's I've been it's more of a go to thing than sort of or oh, tell me about this. I, I love the idea though that you are the you you you're the Muslim. You can represent the views of <laughs> millions yeah, of people. Yeah, yeah. I can't I just kind of think of you know, I, I can't imagine someone coming to me and going you're white <laughs> you know what i mean it's, yeah. yeah i think it's it's that comfortability i've been at the college here for this is my 18th year so people know who i am they've seen yeah. who i am and you know um i suppose they know what they're getting with me i suppose and um i won't you know i'll never you know if somebody asks me a question i'll always be very honest with them but i won't make them feel small and i think it's just having that approach i think that's important Definitely. you've been there 18 years yeah Wow. My 22nd year of education. Wow. I guess you like it then. Yeah, I've done a lot of different roles. So I've, I've been very fortunate and I'm very privileged um, to, you know, I came in as a lecturer and then I be, um, and I did that for three or four years. And then I moved into a pastoral lead mm -hmm. for another four years. And then I was asked to do, um, be a head of division and work with staff again for about another three years. Um, and then I went back to the uh, role of quality and pastoral and then I've gone to safeguarding. So every sort of three to four years, it sort of seems to have changed. So, um, and it's nice because it's all going into the same vessel and all the skills and everything that I've learned, um, it's there to share with people and it's made me hopefully a more rounded person as well. And I guess the fact you've stayed there that time indicates it's somewhere where you feel kind of you know you enjoy being there you feel it's a, a good environment where you can thrive and i think um students and the staff make it for me um i think the students are are, are, are amazing i think you know they're at that as I mentioned earlier they're at that age where they they're at that crossroads where they're going from school to college uh, to, to real life and um and I only live up the road, so it's it's quite nice because I get to see students I taught ten years ago, um, and they look very very different. You know, it makes me feel really old, but um, <laughs> no, because I'll see them sort of like in Sainsbury's and um, I go hello, and I'll get to the stage now where people are saying hello to me and I don't even know who they are. <laughs> they look so different because they come to they come to college with a very sort of um, young baby face and very youthful, and yeah. they're real men with kids, or you know, it's very very different. Um, and it's nice, it's nice to see that. And, um, but yeah, I think, you know, the staff are very good as well. I think, um, I'm not promoting, I'm not, you know, um, you know, I'll just be very honest. I think there's some staff who, you know, they work so hard, they're very open, they're very honest. And it's like a little family. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if I wasn't happy, I, you know, I would have, I would have, I would have looked elsewhere. So, um, no, but it's, you know, and it, I think the students that we get, we get a, and a really nice mix of students as well. You know, it's it's real life. It's a true representation of real life. Tell me a bit more about the the kind of college and, and how big it is and what kind of stuff you specialise in and what kind of students you're drawing on. We've got, um, we have four and a half thousand students. So it's 16, predominantly an FE college, but it, we mainly, mainly focus on 16 to 19 year olds. Mm -hmm. But we have 14 to 16 year olds and we have um, some adult um, courses like access courses and part-time degree courses as well. Um, and we have full-time degree courses. 
So, um, but the, the main sort of bread and butter, if you like, is 15 to 19 year olds, and they come from about 200 different schools in the area. Wow. So, we have coaches that come to the college, and um, we've got about 30 different coach routes, or well, we did have before the lockdown. Yeah. Um, and um, so, they come from all, you know, from we're in the middle of Birmingham and Wolverhampton, so. Um, We've got them from Birmingham, from Sandwell, from Dudley. I'm not sure how familiar people are with the area. Uh, from Worcester, from South Staffordshire. And it's a nice mix. And because it's not, it's, uh, there's no loyalty to one particular school. Mm -hmm. There's no sort of, oh, this is our territory. Everybody comes in as sort of lost little bunnies, if you like, in the first few days. And then they settle in really well. Yeah. By the end of the day, they're sort of exchanging mobile numbers and Snapchat addresses and Instagram. And, um, and it, they then sort of just develop and it's, you know, people respect each other and, you know, this is the age where they can be themselves. So they can wear whatever religious wear they want. They can wear makeup. If they can wear the dresses. They can, if they're transitioning, you know, they're very, very comfortable to be who they are. And it's very central to what we do at the college. So you create a really safe environment for your learners. Definitely. Yeah. Do you think there are any, sort of issues with that because if your learners I mean this it sounds like a wonderful environment but what happens when they leave I mean is this preparing them for the real world yeah I, I was you the majority of our students I would say are here for two years so in year one it's just getting them to fit in um yeah. to not fit in well, fit into sort of part of the adult world where we still have parental contact and um so we don't get away from the parents that quickly with the parents <laughs> and but then in the second half of the year, that's when we then prepare them for university employment, apprenticeships. Um, and that's when they need to start to, they do grow up themselves. Um, you know, they're learning to drive, they're earning money. And naturally it happens, but we do prepare them for the real world. And we do that from the start of sort of, if you like, year 13 in September, where they've got to, they're planning, if you like, for their exit quite earlier on. And yeah. That works really well because then they work harder in class because they know what grades they need to get. They're looking at universities and apprenticeships. And um, even for learners who have got um, learning difficulties and special education needs, um, we have a really good careers department and we've got links with connections and they come in and help make that transition into the world as well. So for me, I, I you know, one of the things I really, really make sure happens is that the students that come to us do not leave and have nowhere to go they've got to have something and they've got to be doing because i wouldn't want that for my own children no and, and that's central to really um how i um view the young people at college yeah. so you're trying to ho help everybody kind of reach their their kind of potential and make sure they're, they're making some good next steps definitely and sometimes they won't listen to you <laughs> they, they won't you know i think that a levels is the only way i want to do a levels and i'm yeah. saying look please trust me do this course you know do this vocational course your grades are borderline you weren't so strong with your exams and you'll get to that in two years time and some listen and they progressed onto university and done really really well some unfortunately have had to do an a, a year of a levels they didn't make they didn't pass the first year so they then had to go to the um a vocational alternative but yeah, definitely. It's a, and it's about just treating them like young adults. So you can have that conversation with them. So yeah. Generally, my approach is I treat them like young adults. If they go into kiddie mode, then I have to go into adult mode. <laughs> um, so it's, um, and, you know, they are, you know, they are nice. They are nice kids. And it's nice because you don't have that emotional involvement with them. So, you, you know, and they don't have that emotional involvement with you. So they listen to you a little bit more and, you know, you can sort of as well. and do you think that because they come into you at this kind of point in their academic career if you like and you don't you know you haven't kind of watched them grow up to this point that you're able to guide them in a different way than if they were to stay on a sixth form for example um i think it's got its pros and cons i think that some people are very comfortable with the school setup and they prefer just to carry on with the sixth form and it's just an extension of school and some people adopt the approach with it's not broken, you know, yeah. why, why change or fix it. Um, but, but I think at college, I think it's that stepping stone into the real world, into real life. Um, and I think it's, you know, you're calling your teachers by their first name, 
you don't have any help, and you, you're, you're making your own way to college, even if, if you can't coach, or, or you make your own way back, and it's then you're being a bit more responsible, and it's, you know, it's taking that step um, into adulthood, I suppose. What other things do you think that for your students, when you're saying you, you want that kind of equality of opportunity that all of your students, you're hoping that they're going to have good places to go after, um, after the college, are there things that kind of typically stand in the way? Like what are the kind of barriers that you have to help students overcome there? Um, I think we've got some students who's, who've never been to, whose parents have never been to university mm -hmm. and you know, they're not sure and their parents don't get it. And it's about that education side of it and explaining to them that, you know, you will have to take out a loan, but you don't pay it back until, because, um, you know, you earn a certain amount of money and because they only hear half of it. They only hear, oh, I don't want my son to, or daughter to come out of university with all this, you know, to come out with all this debt that they've got to pay and they think they've got to pay it straight away. So I think it's education and it's raising the aspirations as well. And also just investing in the young people as well um, and being very, you know, giving them a bit of, tough love and be honest with them when they are making mistakes and telling them that um, you know you can do this but you might need to focus on that uh, reducing this or you need to you know you need to bounce back or if you bounce step back or you need to you know be just be careful how you speak to people because you you're very sensitive how people speak to you but you're not sensitive how people how you speak to people and it's a bit of tough love as well in, so it's coming from a good place but it's just being very honest and open with them and consistency is very important. And do most of your students go to university or a lot of them go into the workplace? Or? Um, good question. Since I started the safeguarding role, I've sort of had less involvement in that area, but I would say it's probably about 65% to uni, 35% okay. to apprenticeships, because I think apprenticeships have improved a lot over a period of time and universities have got more expensive as well for people. So. Is that a big factor in the decisions that your young people are making, the kind of the, the cost of that higher education? I think it's initially with parents because they don't want them to have that debt. But when you realise, when they look at sort of what the repayment plan is and how much it sort of will cost and that they've got to earn up to, I think it's, I think it's twenty thousand pounds now and it's only a minimum of, I don't know, pounds a month. They don't mind it then when it's broken down like that. But when they have it as a whole lump sum, I think it does have an impact. So, for example, I, my background is teaching accounts. I would say to young people, it's probably better for you to get an apprenticeship in accounting or a training programme because you've got that practical experience alongside the theory. Whereas sometimes at university, it's just all theory, 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 and then they're leaving and they don't really know what it's like in the workplace. And there are some really amazing training schemes where they pay a decent salary, they pay for you to become a qualified accountant. Um, I don't have to think of any of that yet. Yeah. So it depends what sector they're in, really, and what area they're in. And do you have to, you know, if you're help supporting students to go into um, sort of apprenticeships, then do you have to work quite carefully to kind of match them with the right work environment? And I mean, that must be more complicated in some ways than university, I would have thought. Definitely. Um, we've got an apprenticeship team. So that because our college is split up into different vocational areas, yeah. They've got an idea. Some of the, the apprenticeships will naturally lend themselves to different vocational areas. So what we then do is we then put them in touch with the careers team and the apprenticeship team. Yeah. Um, and then they're able to then, and we have outside speak, we have guest speakers coming in as well. Uh, and we have careers fairs where we, we get everybody in one place at yeah. one time from different sectors. So even areas where people, you know, like working in a bank, for example, they might not have initially thought about that. Um, yeah they could sort of um, be more drawn towards that. Yeah, so you're trying to open out those those opportunities for them. Yeah. And what do you do um, in terms of the, the kind of broader education of your students? Because it sounds like um, you've got, you know, quite a role there in terms of educating both staff and maybe students in terms of preparing them for life and to be, you know, good citizens yeah. and, and stuff. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Um. Well, we've got a tutorial programme and part of it's about their own progress, but it's also about developing their understanding about being safe online, um, how to treat other people, uh, looking at equality and differences, um, looking at employability skills and making them a more rounded person. So one of the projects, um, I've, I've been on a secondment for two days a week uh, from, from um, Christmas up until sort of April time. 
um, is called Mentors in Violent Prevention. Mm -hmm. And that was with the West Midlands Police. And essentially it's a peer led programme where students will be trained up to deliver scenario. They'll be given a scenario um, about your place in this situation. You, you go to a party, one of your friends is being dragged to the bedroom by another person. What do you do? And it's about being a good citizen. So they have that discussion in the class and they talk about what their train of thought is. They talk about um, what their actions would be and, um, and what organisations could potentially help as well. So it's one of the programmes that we're looking at running, hopefully within the next sort of 12 months, well, six months really, depending on what our situation is, where we're getting students to lead sessions for other students. Oh, wow. Okay. And that will really help improve, improve their employability. If they want to go into teaching, if they want to go into the public service sector or early years, then it really helps give them that, that skill and they can put that on their CV. And presumably the actual stuff itself is it's important stuff for them to, to learn. Do you think they learn it better from each other when they're when oh, they're led like this? Oh, well students play actually a very important role in promoting the college. So we have student ambassadors, mm -hmm. um, we have equality ambassadors, we've got careers ambassadors and wellbeing officers. Um, we have students on the interview panel when we're appointing staff. Um, we've got a student union and the student voice, even on open days as well, we use students and you know, young people are very perceptive. The answers that we come up with, even though we've got, we've done all those years of teaching and training, they come up with exactly the same. They've had 11 years of it and we, we don't realise that when they come to college. They've done it since the age of five and they know, you know, those teachers who, you know, are good and those who, you know, who are trying, who, who, who would struggle. Um, so I was just thinking about, you know, I remember my daughter went to university for a open day we went straight to the doctors and the professors to find out about the course. She went straight to the students uh -huh. and the students sold it to her because, you know, they probably would have said the same thing, but they speak, they're speaking at the same sort of level. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, and they cut to the chase really quickly as well. And if you know a young person is saying that, then it's a bit more value, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. They can often find the, uh, the, the issues quickly. If something's not going to work, they're often uh, able to, to find those issues fast, aren't they? Yeah. Do you find it easy to kind of engage with student voice in a meaningful way? Or is that something you've had to really actively work at? Yeah. So in terms of student feedback, in terms of what they want? Well, in terms of, you know, you, you said you've got these um, ambassadors. So like, for example, your equality um, ambassadors, like what, what, what do they do? And how do you make that more than a kind of tokenistic sort yeah. of a role? So we've got an equality and diversity forum and students, uh, the Equality Ambassadors will be invited to those meetings and they'll also help us plan what events we want to have take place during the course of the year. Mm -hmm. So they've got a very active role within that. So um, because, you know, we're all getting older and we don't know what a young person wants and they might think, you know, actually, we need to do something on self-harm mm -hmm. or we need to do something on mental health and this will be a really good way to capture that. So it's about using them to make it as it effective and have a greater impact as possible so if i was to give you an example we've since um everything's come out about black lives matter there's been students at contact college and saying well i'm coming to your college in september what are you doing to make it a more inclusive college so that's put the responsibility back onto the college and the college have issued a statement saying that we will support black lives matter and we will support you know anti um, the anti-racism agenda and we will support you here and you know your voice is equal uh, as everybody else um, and there's another there was another student who got, who was an existing student and, um, she wrote a very powerful email to us um, really holding the college to account so um, I contacted her and I said well what would you like to do so because we don't have all the answers we, we want to do it and we want to make the change so she goes, well, I think we should do something in tutorial. I go, great, could you do a quiz? And um, she's done a quiz, and it's quite a quiz, to be very honest with you. And um, so I said, do you mind doing a PowerPoint presentation just to educate people um, alongside it? So hopefully, she, you know, she's going to be doing that over the summer, and then we can use that in tutorial to um, educate staff and students, to be honest with you. So it's about giving them that platform so they can feel that their, voices have, their voice is being heard. And we are taking them seriously, because, right? You, people do have equality and diversity policies, and they're just as good as the paper that they're written on. Yeah. And 
but equally I think in the college we need to make sure that we are you know we're, we're showing positive role models in each of the curriculum areas so if some areas are underrepresented by females or by a different group we need to show those images and make sure well actually you know I can become that and um, you know you asked me about role models and I consider myself as being a role model and I think it can, you know, if you can see it, then you can become it. That's how young people generally become. And there are loads of really amazing role models that we need to promote at the college in different. So, yeah. Did you have any of those role models when you were growing up? I couldn't name you one in terms of in the course, but I I do a lot of self reflection, I suppose. So. I always try to look at how I can improve myself and where I've gone wrong. And I've had, I, I have quite a range of different people who, I suppose it's called mentors or mentors board or influencers who I can go to um, and speak to. So I sort of found my own, but I didn't find anybody who was from the same background as me. Um, I found work colleagues who have, and I've shared with. with shared similar experiences and we've you know we've gone through that journey together yeah but not when I was younger no. so if you didn't you know as you said before if you can see it you can aspire to it and do it but if you didn't have those role models there then what gave you the even the idea to go and do what you're doing you know how did you work out what path to go down um well part of it I suppose was when growing up I think my dad worked a lot of hours um, in the post office and there was never really that, you know, a, you know he, he came in this country in the 60s and worked at the post office and, you know, and retired in 1996. Mm -hmm. um, and so his priority is very different, but there was very little, um, I suppose, input in terms of being a role model in the house and his job was just to provide that and I understand that and I respect him wholly for that. I just wanted to make sure that really when it was my turn to get married and have kids that I would have, um, I would pay differently I suppose and that drew me to education so I would be able to have the holidays the same as the kids and my own kids and then spend time investing in them. Yeah. So I suppose um, I've learned by, by, by errors along the way. Um, I remember when I was at school, I, would, I, don't, know if it, I don't know if it's just a, a Birmingham thing or not, but when I left school, people had these little books where they sign, yeah. I think they, and they write notes, and um, somebody wrote something to me about me, and he goes, don't worry, Harun, you'll get there one day. And, Ouch. And I don't know if that was supposed to be like, you know, keep persisting and you'll get there, mm. or if it was supposed to be negative, but I remember that, and I don't know, I think it's, I've had quite a few setbacks, and I've, you know, um, in my life so you know I went to college as a dean and then I worked in a bakery and I took a year out I worked as a baker and then um, I realized I've had light bulb moments I suppose where I think you know what I could do more with my life and mm. I want to make a difference and I suppose I've been quite blessed with the role that I've got at the college because it allowed me to carve up my own, own role and because I am different I suppose it lends itself to equality and people come to me I'm thinking actually Harun, you've got quite a good platform here you can make a difference to it lives so I suppose it's evolved more than anything but then there's been sort of opportunities which I've sort of ceased yeah um to sort of capture when I've arrived but I've had to work hard for it because I I do that alongside other things as well yeah it sounds like you have had to to yeah as you say kind of work hard and kind of carve your own path but at the same time the idea that you're then that that role model to the to the kids as well as sort of aspiring to your own agenda I think is really brilliant is there do you have kind of any kind of unfinished business have you got stuff that you really want to change or things you want to influence um, oh, I think we could it's a nice question that is um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's always things that I want to change, I think. I just, I want people, there's a wonderful video on YouTube called Labels, um, and it's by Prince, E-A or C-E, um, and it's about dropping labels and just seeing people for who they are, and mm -hmm. I'd love to aspire to, for just people to see people in terms of who they are, and not what shell they wear or what colour or gender they are. 
So I suppose I'd probably just keep carrying on and trying to do that for the rest of my life, really, and challenge myself and push myself. So if I feel that I'm judging people, I need to make sure that I'm not doing that. So um, I can't be fake about what I do. So I suppose it's about being true myself, to myself and, um, yeah, just trying to just see people for who they are because that's how I want people to see me. You're quite a harsh critic of yourself, aren't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll go away and think, oh, I've done this really badly. I should have said this, I should have said that. Do you yeah, know, I do reflect not, a lot. It's one of the things that made me most want to talk to you was when you said to me, I don't know why you want to talk to me. I'm not very interesting. And I thought, ah, oh, there's someone I would like to interview. <laughs> yeah. I think still don't know why you want to interview me, to be honest. <laughs> I, I'm just fascinated by um, your well by you really I like I love people I find people really interesting and bluntly I am surrounded by amazing people who are amazing in all sorts of different ways but sometimes the ones who tell me they're amazing are the less interesting ones and it's the people who are more quietly getting on with it and actually just making a difference to people's lives every day they're the ones who really interest me and that's the thing the idea that you're working in this massive college and you're there as a, a role model for your ethnicity and your faith and you're trying to enable your students to aspire to you know the different things than they might otherwise have done I mean that it just fascinates me and um, I think it's a really a really brilliant way to spend your life um, yeah definitely I'm very privileged I, without a shadow of a doubt I'm really fortunate and yeah, um, I, I, you know, the college has given me the opportunity, but I also put the effort in myself to make sure that, you know, it tries to work. And, you know, I think, I think with, uh, with everything going on with the Black Lives Matter, I think it's, you know, um, it's about educating people and it's about starting that new chapter, really, and making sure that we take it that step further forward and we make it a greater difference. Has the Black Lives Matter stuff kind of made you reflect on um, we're doing this pretty well compared to most people or has it made you kind of step back and go, actually, we've got a lot of work to do here? I mean, how's it landed with you? Um, it's scary because we've never done anything like this before. So and some people are warming to it. Some people say I don't need it. Some people say, well, it's all lives matter. And it's really interesting, the different responses. Um, so I think it's some of it's as I said it's, it's about education and it's about being transparent so one of the things I'm doing within the training for unconscious bias is talking about what we're doing at the college mm -hmm. and because we're delivering to I'm trying to deliver to all the staff it's actually saying well look we're doing this you can be an advocate with us it's not us and them and if you want to have a group then you can set that group up yourself as well yeah. so it's about you know saying that here you go look let's let's go for it let's do it but what I don't want it to be is a group where people think they've got special treatment. It's about equity for me, not, you know, um, favouritism or it's just been an in thing. I think the biggest worry for me in terms of Black Lives Matter is that it's got to be long term. And, yeah. You know, I remember, was it Rodney King in the 90s where he got beat up by the LA police and died, you know, and then 30 or 40 years later, we're we're going through the same thing again with somebody else with George Floyd and it's about learning from it and starting to strategize and really you know make it part of the the structure if you like so you know to be inclusive you know we should welcome diversity and we should celebrate that because if a college is truly truly or an organization is truly truly inclusive it doesn't matter if you've got a group for different people because you know that college would that, that organization should um naturally support and listen to those voices anyway does that make sense yeah so yeah. so but we don't we I, don't try and make everyone the same rather we say hey do you know what we're all different and that's okay yeah definitely and i think people are getting equality mixed up with equity go and on I think the black lives matter isn't about you know well you've got the black lives matter i want white lives matter and Muslim lives matter and women lives. It's about equity and you know, there's a lot of catching up for. I, I feel that, um, you know, where black people have been sort of mistreated and, um, you know, um, what's the word? Um, you know, being treated unfairly. And 
you know, they just want the same as everybody else, but there's a bigger distance to travel. Yeah. Um, and I don't like use. this is just me personally, I don't like using the word white privilege because I don't think it helps at all. I think privilege is more important. Mm-hmm. This part of my life, which I'm very privileged, and it's not even linked with colour. And there's parts, sadly, you know, when you say to somebody who's not got a job and they're white, that you've got white privilege, they don't get it. Mm. You know, there's parts of people's lives where they're very privileged, but, you know, let's, let's just talk about privilege. And, you know, I think, and unfortunately, what worries me about the whole Black Lives Matter is that we might get distracted from what the real issues are. And the issues are about being, um, is, is about um, equity, not equality. And I always say to staff and students that, you know, I treat my kids equally, but if I shout at my daughter, she listens. If I shout at my son, he shouts back. I'm treating them both exactly the same way. So I now need to look at the equity in terms of what's going to get through better with both parties. Um, so it does worry me about sort of things might get hijacked and people might use them in the, um, in the wrong context and people using it for their own agenda as well. So I'm worried about the EDL using it for their own agenda and I worry about people who, you know, are very maybe anti-police or anti-white might be using it for their agenda. And, um, you know, I think, you know, we need to show our actions and they speak louder than words. And how do we, I mean, what's your role in that? In your, you know, you're, you're both in your personal life and also in your, in your job at work. I mean, how do you help? this message to land how we want it to and to stick with us for the long term i think we talk about it i think people are very uncomfortable to talk about race because they're scared about offending saying the wrong thing oh i'm not going to say that and it's a closed subject and i think you know have that platform where people can talk about it it's okay to disagree i think we want everybody to agree with us and you know we don't need to we can have our own views but it's about seeing the person and getting on with each other and you know you might disagree with certain things, but it does, and that's your own personal view. But it doesn't mean that you treat them, you know, um, unequally. So, but what I'd like to see really is more structures and systems in place which work hand in hand with organisations to make sure that you know you've got, I suppose, the employers and the employees working together, thinking yeah. right, you know, we want to tackle this and we're going to work together. And we're going to listen and we're going to try and change and we want to tap into your knowledge and your expertise but that does involve a massive change in mindset how could that even happen baby steps or like baby steps and start to show the value and then slowly you know actually that you know this is quite good and we get some really good feedback here and you know our behavior for example at college has improved or you know and results and you know, if, if you've got all of these things coming together, I think, you know, they will, it, it's not going to be done overnight. It's going to take time. Um, and I, I think it's a long term plan, really. But it's yeah. about getting started. And even, you know, when I've retired, it's still going to be there and people will take it on and it becomes part of the strategy. Absolutely. And what do you think, you know, in terms of, there's some big stuff in there and some of those are, you know, projects of a lifetime or more, but in terms of, you know, people listening, if they want to do something right away that makes a difference in their day-to-day life, whether that's in their work or their personal lives, what, what, what should they do? What could they do? I'd say to see it from the other person's viewpoint. Well, two things really, I think stop and think before you make a judgment about somebody Mm -hmm. and just, so, you know, and question if you if you if you've got a very close family, maybe question each other as well when you see them behaving in a certain way. So, for example, if you're in a family car and you stop at the traffic lights, and there's somebody who from a different from background is coming up, and you're thinking, "Quick, block it all!" So you don't, you know, discuss why why are you doing that, and you know, dig that a little bit deeper, and start to seek and ask questions. If you're not sure about something, just ask because. Sadly, you've got people from the EDL, you've got Tommy Robinson, even sort of Nigel Farage, where people are hijacking it and they say, well, you can't say this, it's not politically correct. Talk about it, discuss it, be open about it. If you're not sure, if there's something that's bugging you, then be honest and open about it. So, 
Yeah, I think it's about, so it's about recognising, thinking for yourself, stop and thinking, and look at it from the other person's viewpoint as well. Yeah, you'd be curious. Yeah. It's, it seems to like every everybody who I talk to, I've talked to people on a whole range of different topics, and, and be curious just seems to be a theme that runs throughout. But uh... Because we're not, I think people want us to be programmed, don't they, to think in a certain way, in fact, in a certain way. And I think that creativity of being curious, you know, um, is really, you know, it's, it's a really interesting thread. You were interested, you were curious about me. I'm curious about other people and about how they they live their lives, and that's why I like equality and you know diversity a lot. Yeah. So um, yeah, and I always you know I always ask questions and I get told off by my family because sometimes I ask sort of like the wrong questions or but I'm always just asking and so um, you know that's just me unfortunately. <laughs> I don't think it's unfortunate. Maybe maybe you know your family might disagree, but I, yeah. I think it sounds like a, a you know a great asset. I think it's important to be able to um, explore things and to question things, whether that's yeah at work or at home. It's certainly something we try and encourage of our children that they ask. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what's really interesting. I, I like football, and there I support a football club. I won't tell you which one because I don't want your viewers to sort of switch. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when I'm at a football match. Everybody is one. It doesn't matter where you're from. If you're wearing that colour of that shirt, you're all as one and you're singing together. You're as soon as it's a goal, you're all celebrating together. And it's really nice. I've even took my wife to football matches and she doesn't like football. And you know, we were at, uh, we went to Wembley and there was about four hundred people all around us and thinking we are the only brown faces in the middle of all this stream of white football fans and we didn't feel threatened at all. Mm. And um and it was nice, but then sadly, when people then leave the stadium, they just go their own ways into their own world. Yeah. Um, and it's a shame that that can't sort of carry on really in, in life. Yeah, and bring, coming together for a kind of common purpose. It's a really interesting thought, though, actually, and maybe thinking about how do you create that, you know, what is, you said this earlier on, really looking for commonality, isn't it? And yeah. there you shared a team. But Yeah, well, we did Ramadan football, um, not this Ramadan, but last Ramadan, where we had a football tournament for one day, uh, one day from nine till twelve at night, and it was open to students. They came in. There's a hundred students that came in from all backgrounds. They ate together. Some uh, the Muslims um, prayed, and then they played football in the tournament, and it was amazing because then about half eleven, twelve o'clock, half eleven, they just all left and they all went home, and they were all like talking together, and and they were just doing things together. Wow. And it was so amazing to watch. And it really sort of made me think that, you know, we need to do more of this. Yeah. We need these sort of youth clubs set back where people can mix. You know, when I was growing up, I spent more time in my in, in a church than I did in a mosque because I went to Scouts, I went to Red Cross, I went mm -hmm. to a youth club. Um, so it was really interesting. And I suppose that gave me an appreciation for different faiths and different backgrounds as well. Yeah, I think that's it. It's important, isn't it, to, to just get to know people as people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And look beyond all the other stuff. What um what kind of closing thought would you like to to leave people with? This is the bit where you say something really profound, just you know, okay. just, yeah. Um I treat people how you want to be well, it's not treat people how you want to be treated yourself. And you know, always you know, um, ask those que ask questions, ask, ask, ask. If you're not sure, please just ask. Because I think that anybody who's got any differences are quite happy to talk about their differences. And that will educate you so much. So that's not very profound, but... I don't know. I think if, if everyone listening were to, to take that on board and go do it, that the world would be, you know, you'd have made your ding in the universe. Yeah. And don't be afraid to ask any silly questions because I think people, you know, feel they're going to either offend or they, you know. But if you do it in the right manner, in the right, in the right approach, I think people will listen. What is the right manner to ask a, a kind of potentially oh. offensive question? Um, we'll just say, look, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm really interested in your faith or your background, or and I don't want to offend you. Can you just explain to me what is this issue or what is this about your faith, you know, and and. You know, if you do it, if you do it like that, and people won't feel threatened. Or, but if you said, "Why are you doing that?" Or you know, and you're doing it in such, you know, 
you know, look at him, or you know, if, if you've got people on edge straight away, then they're going to be very defensive. But you know, every person I've met and spoken to have always been quite open and receptive to me asking questions. And when people have asked them questions, I don't know anybody who sort of said, "Well, why are you asking for?" Well, you know, um, so they might be initially suspicious, but then if you explain, "Well, look, you know, I've seen that happening," um, and I, and I've just thought I found it really interesting, and then when you're taking an interest in them. They're quite open about it.